Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Give us a call, 208-991-4783, and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Today's episode is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. Thank you so much for all of your support. Uh, I want to go ahead and we'll get into today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This one is called The Voodoo Matter. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Nelson Price, Johnny. Oh, yes. How are you, Mr. Price? Fine. Got a job for you. You'll have to go to the West Indies. The West Indies? Near Haiti, it seems ledger. Mr. Claude Sheldon holds a big policy with us. We insure him, his wife, and his farm. We've had a lot of trouble. It's going to cost us a lot of money, and we think an investigation is necessary. Come on down to the office, and I'll give you as much as I've got, Johnny. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of a man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste, Plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will too. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office International Insurance and Bonding Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the voodoo matters. Expense account item one, $206.40. Plane fare and incidentals from New York to Port-au-Prince, Haiti. After receiving from you the necessary information concerning the insured, Claude Sheldon. After landing, I checked into the hotel and waited for Claude Sheldon as prearranged. I waited for about an hour. Come in. Dollar. That's right. Mr. Sheldon? Yes. I've been expecting it. Claude Sheldon pushed himself away from the door, grabbed a chair and dropped into it. Took in long, deep breaths and smiled a very slow, weak smile. I would have been here sooner, but there's been more trouble. More trouble, eh? Well, my company told me a little about it, but you better give me your own story. There's me. As you know, I am a farmer. Yeah. My place is near Saint Leger. A number of other farms in the vicinity all doing very well until several months ago. First, it was fired. The cane field was burned. One by one, the cattle became sick. Then some of the farmers grew ill and died. <laughs> Can I get you something? <laughs> Some water, please. Have you been to see a doctor? I'm afraid a doctor can't help. There you are. Thank you. Have you any idea what's wrong with him? Yes and no. 
My Christian religion fights it, but my life on Haiti has taught me deep respect for it. For, for what, Mr. Sheldon? Boo-boo, Mr. Dollar. Oh, I know just what you're thinking. But a doctor in Haiti has examined me and my wife and the others. He can find nothing wrong. Bodo, Mr. Sheldon? I don't expect that you understand. It's hard for me. Perhaps there is something else. I hope you can find out. Well, I'm afraid I can't buy the voodoo theory, Mr. Sheldon. There's one thing. Immediately after my wife and I became ill, I received an offer from my farm. A very low offer from a summer's age banker. I investigated and found it had been made in the interest of one Arthur Cotswold. Arthur Cotswold. I eat his biggest planter. Extremely wealthy. Even after the sick cattle and the fires and everything? Yes. That's why I became suspicious. The other planter <coughs> received similar offers. More water? <laughs> Perhaps I... I don't think I... <laughs> Mr. Dollar! Mr. Sheldon! I called the hotel desk for a doctor, but by the time he'd gotten Sheldon to the hospital, the patient was dead. The authorities were called in and I was questioned. A preliminary examination was made on the dead man, but the cause of death remained a mystery. So an autopsy was ordered. I told the chief of police to forward the report to me at San Leger and left for the Sheldon farm. Expense account item two, five dollars American for a beaten up taxi to take me ten miles into the country. A crowd of natives were standing in front of the Sheldon house as we drove up. I didn't know what it was. No one said a word. But something was wrong. I could feel it. I walked through the crowd and up to the house and stopped cold as the door opened. Who are you? I'd never seen anything like him. A native who was a good seven feet tall and must have weighed at least 300. Me, Bimba. Who are you? Me, John... I mean, uh, I'm Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. You from United States? Yeah. I'm supposed to investigate the trouble here. Me no. Master Shelton, tell me. I uh, saw Master Shelton about an hour ago. He dead. How the? How do you know he died? You come in house. All right. What are all those people doing out there? Their friend, Madame. She died too. <laughs> Bimba led the way into the bedroom, where Mrs. Sheldon lay on the bed, covered with a fresh white sheet, her eyes closed in death, her face drawn and tired. Bimba told me that she died about an hour before, and a cold chill ran up my back. I remembered her husband lying on the floor of my hotel room about an hour before. Bad voodoo. Is that why the cattle are sick and the fields burned? We oui, bad voodoo. Mr. Sheldon thought a man named Cotswold might have something to do with it. Mr. Cotswold, big man. Very powerful. What are those drums? For Madame and Master. A voodoo. Good voodoo. Give blessing for spirit. For Madame and Master. I see. I want to talk to the police in saint Leger. Who do I see? Me take you. Right then, I inherited Bimba. And if there was going to be any trouble, the giant servant would certainly help to make up for any lack on my part. The first thing I wanted to do was to contact the authorities in San Leger. And Bimba told me my man was Inspector George. Bimba saddled up two horses from the barn, and together we rode back to San Leger. Bimba pointed out the inspector's office and waited in front while I went in. Ah, uh, oui, Monsieur Dollar. The Sheldons were a very fine family. I knew them very well. How did everybody know they were dead? On I see things of such nature are never a secret. The natives know. Voodoo? Being a stranger to Haiti, Monsieur Dollar, I expect you to be a skeptic. 
But you're not. Let us say I've been in IT too long to be one, huh? Oh. You know a man named Cotswold? I would suggest you start guessing, Monsieur Cotswold. Why? Monsieur Cotswold is a very prominent man. Yes, yeah, so I've heard. He is the largest plantation owner in the West Indies. A self-made man with a considerable temper. I'll mention it in my report to my office. Eh bien, as you wish. But Monsieur Cotswold is looked upon by the people of saint Leger with a great deal of respect. It is my opinion that you should avoid him. First, because I am certain he will not be in sympathy with your motives, and second, because the opposition you will encounter will be far reaching and much too difficult for you to handle. What if I come up with something incriminating? Oh, for your sake, I hope you do not. Oh. What do you do here in San Jose, Inspector? I am the law, Monsieur Dollar. But uh, you wouldn't like it if this Cotswold were guilty of breaching that law? If Monsieur Cotswold has broken the law, it would certainly be my duty to arrest him. But I am not considering the arrest. No necessary steps that would have to be taken to prove the guilt. Dangerous steps, Monsieur Dollar. One might trip on those steps and break his neck. For ten years I have been the law. If tomorrow Cotswold decided it was time for me to relinquish my position, I should probably retire. So you prefer the middle of the road, eh? <laughs> it is much easier to see what is ahead. You can always get run down from behind. Uh-huh. I do as much as I can to prevent that possibility. No, again, my suggestion that you forget... Monsieur Cotswold. I left the philosophical inspector and went back to Bimba, still sitting outside on his horse. Every time I looked at him, it was like a little kid spotting the Empire State Building for the first time. He smiled a mouthful of white teeth and leaned over to give me a hand up. He caught me by the wrist and lifted me into my saddle as though he was hoisting a small bundle of laundry. The inspector... He say, forget Mr. Cotswold. What? Stand up. Oui, monsieur. Oh, forget it. What do you think I should do? Me think you do what you want. And you know what I want. Oui. You want to go see Mr. Cotswold. The inspector says I shouldn't. You go anyway. You think it's a mistake? If you're afraid, but you're not. You're not strong like Bimba, but you could fight it. I don't like to fight, Bimba. Bimba know that. We go see Mr. Cotswold. We swung our horses around and Bimba led the way up a long, narrow road, surrounded on both sides by sugarcane fields. Somewhere, from not too far away, I heard the drums start again. Bimba straightened in his saddle and looked off to the north. He began moving his shoulders slowly keeping time to the steady rhythm of the drum. Then he began to sing softly. What does that mean, then? It means in your language, it is our papa who has it. Papa? Papa Dambala, the great sport. Buddha. We. Oui. I later must leave you. Today, Wednesday, is the day of Papa Dambala. He turned back to the north and continued his little chant until we reached the beginning of a long, high fence running along next to the narrow road. Bimba leaned down and swung open a big gate. Then we rode up the path and led through the Cotswold property until we reached the house. Sitting back between two huge trees was the Cotswold mansion. Bimba stayed on his horse and I climbed down and walked to the front door. Mr. Della, what's up with Mr. Jocelyn? He guard Mr. Cotswold. Thanks. What do you want? I'd like to see Mr. Cotswold. You do, huh? What are you doing here, Bimber? I wait for me, sir. Found himself a new governor, huh? You must be that dollar fella. I must be. 
Well, come in. Mr. Cotswold's been expecting you. Jocelyn wasn't a very small man himself. Looked as though he was capable of handling just about any situation that might come up. He led the way into a large paneled study, and I met Arthur Cotswold. The drums had stopped. I know why you're here, Mr. Dollar. Well, then that should make it a lot easier for both of us. For some reason, the farmers are suspicious. Their fear is divided between me and Voodoo. Children convinced some that I might be responsible. And of course you're not. Of course. Sheldon thought you might want to get control of the other farms in San Jose. I simply tried to help them. With their cattle sick and their crops gone, I had my banker make them an offer. What would you want with sick cattle? I could use the land. Do you think the cattle will get better and the crops won't fail if you control the land? I intend to do away with the sick cattle. I have no use for the crops. Hmm. Have uh, any of your cattle been affected? None. That's pretty strange. Haiti is a strange land. And on this point, I would most certainly give you advice. Go home, Mr. Dollar. Leave well enough alone. Well enough is pretty bad, the way I see it, Mr. Cotswold. And I'll leave after I've gotten a few answers. Mr. Dollar, I am not a patient man. I've gone out of my way to give you some healthy advice. Eat it for your sake. I won't forget it for a minute. You persist in this investigation? I get paid to persist, Mr. Cotswold. Friends, you know Wrigley's Fear Mint Gum is a delicious treat that millions enjoy all year round. It's good to chew almost any time and any place. In warm weather, you'll enjoy especially the refreshment that Wrigley's Spearmint Gum gives you. When your mouth feels hot and dry, or when you're feeling warm and tired, chewing Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a pleasant little lift. It cools your mouth, moistens your throat, and refreshes your taste. Besides, chewing on a good smooth piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum seems to add enjoyment to whatever else you're doing. So enjoy it at home at work, wherever you are. And remember, Wrigley's Beer Mint Gum is a swell treat to take along on picnic. Get plenty for everybody. That's Wrigley's Beer Mint Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I left Arthur Cotswold, picked up Bimba, and he led me back to town. On the way, I got an idea. When we arrived in town, I sent Bimba back to the Sheldon farm. Then I went in to talk to Inspector George. The inspector had received a wire from the authorities in Porto Prince concerning the autopsy on Sheldon. I had no idea the authorities in Porto Prince were interested in this affair. Oh. May I see that? Probably it's got them in there. Oh. Oh, well, here's something pretty interesting, Inspector. Mr. Sheldon died of a disease known as brutalosi, commonly known in cattle as Bang's disease. I read that account. Ever heard of brutalosi, Inspector? I'm not a medical man, Mr. Dallal. Undulant fever. Sheldon and his wife probably caught it from their sick cattle. But, yeah, that you have solved the mystery. No, no, not quite. I want to find out why all the cattle belonging to the small farmers got sick. And not the ones belonging to Miss Cotswold. What do you intend to do? I think those cattle were infected and the cane fields burned deliberately. If the cattle were infected, there might be some of the Brusilosi still around. And I'm going to find it. And uh, I think you'd better issue a search warrant and come with me. Ah, no, Monsieur Dallard. The middle of the road, remember? I think you'd better start modifying your policy, Inspector. Unless you want me to get in touch with Porto Prince huh? and... Ask that you be held as a material witness in a murder case. I will issue the warrant. I uh, kind of thought you would. I will issue it, but you certainly don't think it will be able enough to get you into that house. No, but it'll make it legal. 
I sent Bimba back to collect some of his friends. They're going to help us get into that house, Inspector. Oh, no. I will take no part in violence. They will be with us. It'll be easy to search the Cotswold. This is Cotswold without fighting a fire. A fire? Oh, just a harmless fire. But far enough away so that Cotswold will think it's his cane field. Oh. Well, I don't agree with such methods, Monsieur Dollar, but uh, as long as it's a harmless fire, I will issue the warrant. Well, welcome back to the gutter, Inspector. The view isn't much, but you can't miss where you're going. When we reached the Sheldon farm, we saw a crowd of natives standing out in front. Again, something was wrong. We piled out, pushed our way through the crowd, and inside the house we found what it was. Lying in the middle of the room was Bimba. He was almost dead when I knelt beside him. It means taking the spirit from the head of your dead. He wants you to see it. You say you believe voodoo. All right, Bimba. I'll stay. You see. Believe. Bimba. No, no, no. no. You say. next few hours, I'll never forget. The natives came into the house and placed Bimba on a bench. Then the ceremony began. They carried live pigeons, olive oil, 30 pieces of fat pine wood, a pair of chickens, and some coarse cornmeal. They covered Bimba's body with a saddle blanket, killed the chickens, roasted the cornmeal, and put it in a large white plate. The pine wood slivers were lighted and held like candles... And a man they called Donay took the white plate in one hand and the pot with the chicken in the other and approached the fire, chanting a strange dirge. Then as Donay finished the last line of the chant, the body of Mimba sat straight up with straining eyes bowed its head, and fell back. The inspector and I drove over to Cotswold's house and waited while the moon climbed up over the clouds and the drums in the distance tangled my nerves into knots. After an hour of waiting, a dull glow to the south started the expected commotion in the Cotswold household, and we climbed out of the car. Oh, Mr. Cotswold! The time for you! Get the brothers, get them in the house, and fight that fire! Hey! It's well. Yeah. Give them a few minutes and we'll go into the house. Now. Now. The inspector and I took the Cotswold house apart like a well-trained wrecking crew and came up with... Exactly nothing. Well, Monsieur Dolan, isn't there a barn out back? We? Oui. Then let's go. The drums were louder now, and the dull glow of the fire had nearly vanished. The inspector took one end of the barn, and I took the other. We worked toward each other. And just about the time I was ready to give the whole thing up. Monsieur Dolan, you find something? Please. Huh. A hypodermic for cattle. That's not enough. And these? I found it under that box. A bottle. Might not be anything. Ah, but we could take it back to town and have it analyzed. Well, that's about all we can do. This is the only thing we've got. Let's go. I'm a straight on. Stand right where you are. Hello, Mr. Cotswold. You know the inspector, don't you? For a number of years. I must say, I didn't expect this of him. I have a search warrant, Monsieur Cotswold. Oh, very interesting. See if they have any weapons, sir. Right. 
I assure you we are well within our rights. This warrant is... Shut up and raise your hand. Better do as he says. A commendable suggestion, Mr. Dollar. But I'm afraid you've learned prudence a little too late. I never argue with a gun. They both got guns, Mr. Carpenter. You're making a serious mistake. I'm afraid the mistake is yours and Mr. Dollar's. Get the bottle of the hypodemic. Yes, sir. Is that the stuff you've been inspecting the cattle with? It is. You see, you really should have taken my advice and returned to the States. And I'm surprised at you, Inspector. I really thought you were more sensible. Sometimes a man finds his pride and does the best thing. <laughs> and this is the best thing. Right, it sounds foolish. But I think it is. You know, of course, that I cannot allow either of you to live. Tell me something. Who killed Bimber? I think Jocelyn can answer that. But enough conversation. I leave the details in your hands. Yes, sir. Goodbye, gentlemen. All right, start walking. Just leave. You won't get up. Now do what I tell you and start walking. The drums have stopped. Just keep moving right out the gate. What about the drums? What does it mean? I don't know. Uh. Mr. Cartwright! Mr. Cartwright! Oh, I tell you, stop running, Sarah! Go on! We ran into the house with Jocelyn right behind us. He ordered us to go ahead of him into the dark study. And that's where we found Cartwright, stretched out on the floor, his dead eyes staring up at us, his mouth open in a soundless scream. His neck had been broken. Ah, yes. Uh, who's here? Monsieur Dollar. Who is it? Who's in this room? <laughs> no! No! Get away! Get away from me! You're dead! <laughs> yeah. ah! You won't believe it, and to this day I'm still not sure. But there in the darkness was a huge man. And he looked exactly like Bimba. Jocelyn shot him six times, and he kept right on coming. Then he grabbed Jocelyn and crushed him like an eggshell. <laughs> By the time we'd collected our wits, the giant had disappeared through the door and into the night. Monsieur Dollar. I think I'll sit down. Uh, what did... What did he buy? I don't know. I don't want to know anything. I just want to get on the first plane back to the States and relax for a week in a tub of hot mud. looks like Bimba. If you're inclined to believe in voodoo, perhaps it was. I talked to some of the natives before I left and it didn't seem unusual to them. Cotswold was a bad man and Bimba had come back from the dead to avenge his people. I know it sounds crazy, but I'm telling it to you just the way I saw it. Or am I? Well, anyway, it's the inspector's problem. Expense account items three and four, $250. Hotel bill, plane fare, and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $461.40. If you want any more information, you can contact me at the Greenbrier Rest Home. I'll be the third mud pie from the left. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Always keep some hands for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. (laughs) 
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in today's cast were Tudor Owen, Parley Bear, Roy Glenn, Ben Wright, Bill Conrad, and Jester Hairston. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at the same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. Well, if Blake Edwards' name appears on a Johnny Dollar script, um, then you know that it was basically a recycled uh, Richard Diamond script, pretty much. This uh, one was based on an episode of Richard Diamond, a private detective called Little Shiva, uh, from March the 23rd of 1951. You know, I, I do have to say that... Uh, you know, it's all, almost too predictable uh, when you have a situation where Haiti is mentioned in an old-time radio. You know, you know that by the end of the episode, uh, you're going to hear Voodoo uh, uh, in the story. And, you know, it's I don't know if it's all that different uh, today. Um, I, I think that... Uh, I think that probably doesn't help tourism much. But overall, a somewhat bizarre ending, not really fitting too much into the typical uh, detective story with a uh, suggestively supernatural uh, type ending. Uh, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be back next week with hopefully a more normal episode of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Um, I... Uh, I, I, I do, I do want to encourage you to, uh, check, uh, email me box13 at greatdetectors.net. For those of you who have the premium site, we do have an extra show, uh, uh that we've gone ahead and added the list of the shows we're gonna do, uh, Meet Miss Sherlock, and so, uh, an unhosted extra is posted there. You can follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and give us a call, 208-991-4783. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.